Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic, and now we're, we're approaching one year, actually. Um, I started doing these in March. Um, but it's been great because we've had so much great information available on the Sherwood Equine um, YouTube channel, and people are really loving the webinar. So I'm just going to keep on rolling here, and, and who knows how many we'll gather. Um, just so that you all know, we have our fifth anniversary Surefoot contest going on. We're in week three. So the weekly drawing will be happening tomorrow to win a pair of Surefoot pads. You need to go to the Fans of Surefoot page or the Surefoot Equine page on Facebook to sign up. Um, it's this week, it's where's your nearest uh, Surefoot practitioner. And since Catherine is a Surefoot practitioner, you can say in my backyard if you live in Lovettsville. Um, <laughs> And then just remember that you have to enter all five weeks to be uh, registered for the grand prize drawing of a full set of Surefoot pads value over $1,000. If you missed a week, no problem. You can go back and just put in your, your entry for that week. And we're gonna make that a little bit easier for you. Alex, my assistant is gonna make sure we have some posts available for you. Um, so you have to enter all five weeks. We're keeping track of that. And then on week six, we'll just check with everybody make sure that we got all your names. And then we'll draw that grand prize on week six. All right, and today I'm so excited to have my friend Catherine Wyckoff come back for another fabulous webinar. Um, Catherine is a fellow Feldenkrais practitioner, horse lover, enthusiast, and, um, and, and been with Surefoot since the beginning, literally the first day. He was um, the third horse. <laughs> yeah, that's such a great picture of Andy. And so, um, you know, Catherine and I have uh, shared a lot of stuff in common, and I'm so excited today that she's going to talk about uh, how to help aging women ride, um, ride better. Um, so Catherine, just for those people who don't know you, can you just give us a bit of your background and how you got here? Definitely. So I'm originally from Belgium. I was trained as a physical therapist and I've been doing it for over 30 years. So I've always been fascinated by movement. So I started in physical therapy and then I did the Feldenkrais training, which is how I got to meet you in 2007. Um, and then I got trained in hippotherapy. <clears throat> what we do in hippotherapy is we use the movement of the horse to help improve movement in the people who are astride. I do it a lot with the children with special needs. So I've been interested in the effect of the movement of the horse on the person. And I know that it's very therapeutic. What it also gives me is the training to figure out how to help people who have all kinds of impairments be safe on a horse and enjoy riding. I have a lot of riders who use wheelchairs um, to move around and yet we can still have them find a way for them to be safely on the horse and to have fun. So aging is really nothing compared to that. Don't worry, we have plenty of ideas. Um, I'm trained in myofascial release. I'm working in ergonomics. So I'm used to helping people set up their environment so that it works for them. I'm a lifelong horse lover and horse owner. And I live on a farm where I take care of uh, three horses and I'm an aging woman. So I totally feel you. <laughs> I really hated moving the snow, moving in the snow and the hay and all that. Um, Recently, I became a physical therapist for horses as my horses got older and as I saw my therapeutic riding horses getting um, having movement issues because their riders by definition are not balanced, I became more interested in it. So then I learned the effect of the rider of the horse and I learned the movement of the horse. So I really am a movement nut basically and I looked at it from any way I could look at it. And I find myself now doing a job that I love, which is working with aging riders and with uh, children with special needs. So that's basically who I am. Also, my first language is French, so that's the funny accent that you hear right now. And um, what I know about Catherine is, is she never stops learning. Um, Catherine's okay. always exploring something new. And every time I talk to her, it's like, oh, I've discovered this. Or, oh. so it's great because you're always adding to your body knowledge. There's so much information out there, right? We only, you learn a little bit at a time. And I learned so much in my writing with Woody, whatever I learned in my writing, I can, then apply to my writer to to my writer patient so it's really great and it's really it's really it drives me the reason why we're doing this seminar today I, I approached Wendy and I said can we do one on aging women writers because every time a patient comes to see me 
and tells me that they're afraid that they will not be able to ride as long as they want to, that they're afraid of getting back on a horse after an injury, or they're afraid that um, their pain will stop them from riding. I know what that feels like. I mean, as a rider, it's not a luxury, it's something that you need. And I also know how therapeutic riding a horse when you do it safely is. And so I'm really, whenever people come, I'm thinking, oh no, I need to tell everybody that it's not, aging is not a death sentence. It's just a group of things that you need to manage, but it's really not something that you're stuck with. Um, so I'm really, really happy you know, and to do Catherine, this. I, that brings up a point that I hear so often. Um, when I'm teaching riding clinics, uh, my women will say, I'm so old. And I'm like, how old? Are oh, I'm 50. I'm 55. I'm like, we had an 84 year old woman come on horseback safari with us to Kenya. And so what I tell my, if you're not 84 years old, then you're not old. Right. Just think about Linda, Linda Tellington Jones right. at every workshop. She gets on a horse that she's never seen before. And she rides them without a bridle after, I mean, she's just phenomenal. Right. So um, age, it's not age. That's the issue. It's what, what you're doing really. That is. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Right. So it's, it's, but often we have a mindset for whatever reason that we're old. And, you know, I think that that is such a limiting factor for so many women riders. They just, they just decide that they're old. So that's, is that something that happens because something's happened to their body or is that just a cultural thing? I think it's a combination of both. I think, um, so, uh, the way I look at aging, it's not one thing, it's a group of things. And so today let's talk about, there's six things that are very common that everybody deals with that can be fixed. And let's address them because they're easy. Because I think if you think aging is a problem, but then the first physical thing you, that happens to you that kind of confirms that you're, it's harder for you to move or you're more stiff, you're thinking, oh yeah, it's aging. So it just kind of confirms what you thought was happening. And it doesn't have to be that way. So the six things I propose we talk about, the six parts of aging are injuries, which obviously I don't have to, <laughs> every one of you here has had many injuries I know, which then leads to scars. We're gonna talk about scars too. We're gonna to talk about habits of movement. We're gonna talk about hormonal changes that women go through we're gonna talk about the decrease in awareness that we go through as we age and also repetitive stress injury. All of these are part of aging. Um, so let's just, and all these can be managed or fixed. So let's, let's just talk about that. So to, to understand what aging is, and, and I'm talking about aging as it pertains to movement today, right? That's my field of expertise. So we're gonna talk about aging when it, talking about movement. So to understand how we got here today, maybe it's good to understand how we learn to move. So when you start as a baby, your brain is a quarter of the size of the brain of the size it will be as an adult. So you actually make and build and wire three quarters of your brain. How do you do that? Well, the first year of your life, the brain, um, the brain weight doubles. So in the first year of life, you learn all these movements. I mean, when you think about it, when you're born, you cannot even roll over. And in one year of age, you can walk. So the amount of learning that happens in that first year of age is phenomenal. The amount of wiring that happens. So no wonder your brain doubles in size, right? And so it gets organized for functional movement, for learning to drink, to reach for food, to roll over, to crawling, all the way up to walking and running. So how do you do that? babies don't go to movement schools, right? They don't read books. Their parents don't read books to them to teach them how to move, right? What they do is they roll on the floor and they explore, they're curious, they do tons of repetition. It's not a linear movement. If you ever had a chance to, to see a child grow up, um, you will find that all of a sudden one day they can sit and then for three months they don't sit anymore. I don't know how many parents come to see me and say, he could sit and now he can't sit anymore. That's okay because he doesn't care that, that he's sitting. He's exploring something else. And then when he goes back to sitting three months later, the sitting is better. So um, curiosity, exploration, no judgment, no pain, and lots of rest because the resting is when the brain actually consolidates the rewiring and the programming that you've done. 
by the end of the first year, second year, third year, the child has developed some kind of a nice movement software in their brain that is unique to them because nobody taught them. Everybody learns their own thing and everybody learns it differently. Everybody's got a different structure, a different environment and a different brain. So you end up with something that is really unique to you. And it becomes, when it, uh, around three or four or five years of age, it becomes automatic. You don't have to think about it anymore. Like for example, now, if you were walking to the next room, you, you don't have to say, okay, I'm going to put my heel on the floor and then my toes, and then I'm going to shift my weight. No, you just turn on the program, the walking program, and it goes, right? And so that program is so unique to you that people can be recognized through their movement. When you see somebody coming from far away, you can't see their face yet, but you can already recognize who they are, right? Or sometimes their posture. So one of the definitions of habits that works for habits of movement, it's something that everybody knows about you, but that you don't know about yourself, right? Because we are not aware of what we're doing. For example, now you're sitting, do you know how you're sitting? Do you know if you have more, more weight on one side or on the other? Just take a minute to feel. Can you tell? Is it clear? Well, if you're a rider, your sits bones are what you use to talk to your horse all the time. So do you know what you're telling them? You might be telling them stuff that you don't want to tell them, but you don't even know you're doing it, right? So the habits of movement are great. But then sometimes they can get on the, in the way on the way of what we want to do. And the reason why I'm mentioning habits of movement now is I'll take an example. Let's see that you always put more weight on your left leg, that you always go up the stairs with the left one. It's the strongest one for some reason. Well, if you keep on doing that for 50 years, there's a chance that the left knee or the left hip is going to start talking to you because they've been used twice as much as the right one. Right? So habits of movement really have a big part in aging because we tend to overuse certain parts if we get stuck into our habits. So we'll talk about solutions in a minute. So for all those six things, I didn't mention that, but those six parts that I talk about, we're going to talk about solutions to fix them because these are all fixable. All right, so then you're six years old. We're gonna continue the story. You start going to school or four or five years old, depending on where you live. And then gradually you're being taught and you learn systematically to start to ignore the signals from your body. If you go into a pre-K class, those little things keep move all over the place. They don't stay seated for a while because the moment they feel something from their body, they change and they fix it. But then as you go to elementary school, middle school, high school, all of a sudden people become able to sit for longer periods of time without moving. Like right now, you and I are going to be speaking for an hour and I will be sitting on the chair and not move much because you've been trained to do that. You become able to ignore signals from your body to the point where when you get to working age, you don't notice anything until you're in pain. And by that time, sometimes it's a little bit hard to go back and to fix it. It's harder. If you'd fixed it at the beginning when you just had mild discomfort, it would be easier, right? Two other examples of uh, desensitization. Man, I've practiced that. I've practiced that word so many times. Um, it's, for example, for women, it's the area where the bra strap is in the middle of the back. You have learned to ignore it. You have learned to ignore signals from that part of your back. Remember when you first wore a bra, do you remember how all you could think about what, how does that feel? And you could feel it on your ribs, right? And so it's not uncommon for women to have pain in the middle of the back because they don't feel anything there until they get to the pain. That's another, another example. A third example for riders is the feet. We wear those boots and those big shoes. And so the feet become blocks that we move from place to place. We don't... Um, we don't play with our toes like you would on a beach on the sand, right? So we desensitize our feet as well. So then when we're desensitized, we don't really realize that we've injured ourselves or that we hurt until we get there. So that's one of the problems. 
So that's how we learn, that's how we go through life movement wise, right? And then if you don't change your habits, if you get stuck in them and repeat them over and over, you start overusing and wearing out certain joints. Another thing that happens is injuries. Mm. How many times did your horse step on your feet? Just that, I'm not even talking falls or anything, just how many times did you get stepped on? So what happens when you have an injury is while you're healing, your body reprograms those movement softwares that you had designed as a kid, right? They're still in your brain, but your body changes them a little bit so that you don't put too much pressure on the part that's healing. So unconsciously, you're not aware of it, but your brain changes what you're doing. That's why people limp. You can usually see when somebody's hurting because they move differently, right? They don't always know it, but you can see it. So pain and injuries can change your movement patterns and your program. They can change how your, bra how your brain manages your movement. Catherine, so there's also the subtle avoidance of doing things when you have pain. Does it uh, explain? In other words, I can remember so clearly when I had my ribs broken, long story, um, I started avoiding, I avoided movements right? But I avoided interactions. Like I, I didn't want to be around the horses because I, my nervous system knew I was vulnerable. So suddenly you, you start avoiding things also. And you wonder why am I, you know, I, I, you lose interest in something in a way because your nervous system is like, that's not safe, but it's subtle. It's very, yeah, and it's, and it's unconscious, right? It's something that happens without you knowing it. And one of the examples of that is just falling. If you fall on the ice, um, it's amazing how the brain goes absolutely haywire with falls. And so, of course, when you fall from a horse, it, it, it's a different dimension, right? But there's a life and death thing. And so your brain will keep you away from whatever. Yeah. From then on, whenever you see ice, your brain goes into full alert mode, right? It's really something that you, we don't want to do. So yes, this happens in the background. So unless you make it conscious, and you can hardly do it yourself because remember, you don't know that about yourself, right? That's why you go see a physical therapist, a Feldenkrais practitioner, and some, somebody who can look at your movement and show you what you're doing. Because usually it's, it's not all that you need, but I don't know how many times I've seen people say, oh my God, I'm doing this. Once you know you're doing it, then you can start changing it. But until somebody points it out to you, you can't do it. So what's happening in the background is not a conscious thing. And what happens with the injuries most of the time, we don't want to spend time at the physical therapist or doing our exercises or whatever. So what we do is once we heal 90%, that's good enough. We keep on going, right? Then the second injury, you get 90% again. So it's 90% of 90%, right? And then the third injury, it's 90% of 90% of 90%. By the time you're 50 or 60, you're working on 20%, right? Because as you said, you've stopped moving the ribs and then you stop moving the left shoulder and then you stop moving the right hip and you end up using just one joint for everything. Yeah. And so then you come to see me and say, my left knee's hurting. And then I tell you, wow, that's the only thing that still works well in you. And you said, no, it's hurting. And I said, yeah, because that's the only thing you're still using. And so a big part of what Wendy and I do in the Feldenkrais method is getting the other parts to participate again so that it's not just that one joint that gets to do everything, even things they don't want to do. And Catherine, uh, you know, for me, what I've always noticed is the part that isn't moving, I don't, it doesn't hurt, but the overuse part is the one that starts to scream. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The lazy parts that don't do anything, of course they don't hurt. They don't do anything, they couldn't hurt, right? So it's often the best part that is the one that hurts. So what's the solution to injuries and to habits of movement? But it's, it's relearning how to feel first so that you don't go all the way to the pain, right? That's one thing to do. And it's also doing something like the Feldenkrais method. So we talked a little bit before, Wendy and I are both Feldenkrais practitioner. I'm gonna make it really short, a short description, but Moshe Feldenkrais, uh, the Feldenkrais method is based on his last name. His name was Moshe Feldenkrais. And he studied how humans learn to move. And he was the, one of the first ones to realize that our brains can be reprogrammed at any age. We used to think that they were stuck 
but he was he discovered practical neuroplasticity before the studies mm. that discovered it you know officially and so his genius came in the fact that he figured out how to design a lesson a movement lesson to rewire a brain for optimal brain rewiring so the way we do this there are different ways to do it um, you could do it in a lesson form where you have a group of people that are guided verbally to a series of movement and those series of movements really go directly to your brain and reprogram it so that your movement then becomes a little bit better there's more of you involved in it you, you become aware of the part that you weren't aware of before and then sometimes the lessons are not your your way of learning everybody has a different way of learning you can also go see somebody either wendy or i or any feldenkrais practitioner where we can help you feel what it is that you're not doing or is not working we do it with our hands most of the time but not always and then we can help you relearn through gentle movement so it's really based on the same way babies learn so it's about no pain small slow gentle repetition fun curiosity exploration so we don't fix what's not working. We re-give you access to the whole of you. That's basically what we do. And, and Catherine, um, with people, we don't come with a manual on how to move. We're, we're so neuroplastic as babies, whereas like a horse is already got that wiring. So like using Feldenkrais on a horse, in, I think most of the time you're restoring movement. But with people, we actually have to learn new possibilities of movement because you know, some people crawled when they were babies, some cross crawled, some lateral, and we all moved differently. So there's parts of movement that we may have missed in that early childhood development. Yeah, the, the way to think about it is we each, we each create our own homeschooling, right, when it comes to movement, and not everybody gets all the courses, right? right. You might not have gotten the course on, on crawling because you might have gone from rolling to sitting. You know, uh, my daughter, when she was little, would she didn't crawl for a long time. She would sit somewhere and then get on her belly, roll to the other side of the room and then sit. That was her way of doing it. My son was a big crawler and never did the rolling. So, you know, everybody gets different lessons. And so one of the tools that I found to be really helpful, if you don't have access to a Feldenkrais practitioner before you're going to ride your horse or anything like that, the sure foot pads are really cool. Use them if you have them for your horse. Um, it really depends on what you're looking for. But I find that if you have a hard time, for, for example, figuring out whether you have more weight on one leg than the other, or whether you have more weight on your toes or on your heels, the soft one, the blue one makes it really obvious because you stand on, you stand on it and boom, you, really, you really sink into the place where you have more weight, right? If you're on a hard floor on, the, on a hard surface, it, it's harder to feel because you don't have the displacement of your leg that you get on the pads. So the surefoot pads, of course, um, Wendy developed them based on the Feldenkrais method, right? And I think my thinking of it is that a big part of what they do is they make the horse aware of what they're doing, right? They also have their habits of movement that they don't know about, right. that they developed for some reason, right? Plus they have to deal with humans, but that's a different thing. <laughs> and so what I find that, um, I call this a solution because you don't always have to go see a fellow in Christ practitioner or take a class. I teach two classes a week and I have a bunch of students, a lot of them are on the call today, who just enjoy coming once a week and just kind of rewire the brain, reprogram, refresh it. You know, it's like an automatic update, basically. But I find, I don't, you probably find the same way. Now I've been doing Feldenkrais for over 20 years. And so I feel like now my brain automatically does the updates. I don't have to really spend a lot of time doing it anymore. I get to a point where I feel the pain coming on and then I feel it leave because somehow the moment I notice it and I kind of think about it for a minute, my brain kind of goes, okay, explores and then fixes. And I don't know what happened, but it went away, right? Well, and, and I have think that you bring up a really good point that um having practiced the feldenkrais method we notice things quicker yes. before they get out of control so we can sense it and then address it and let it go before it builds and i think that you know the sooner you can catch something the better off you are and so that brings you to the fear of aging because i'm not afraid of aging 
I hurt myself all the time. I'm five foot four and I drive a tractor and I lift hay bales. And of course I hurt myself all the time. It doesn't matter. It's only for a little while and then it gets better, right? Rather than feeling that your world is collapsing little by little because you haven't gone back to square one after each injury you have, right? So, Catherine, to, to give an analogy, I, I remember I've always had very good eyesight and ha didn't need to wear glasses. And then I noticed that things were getting worse and worse. And I finally gave in and got glasses, but I needed them for a lot longer than when I finally got to the point where I couldn't see anymore. And I think this is true with so many people with injuries is that it's happening little by little, you're losing movement little by little. And then suddenly there's an event and that event is then what cascades the whole thing. But if we could catch that sooner, just like realizing, hmm, I needed glasses two years before I got them. <laughs> but I was so resistant to glasses, right? Now I always get fancy frames, but, but I had to make it fun, right? I had to make it so yeah. important. But that's the thing is I think that we, we, how many horse people do you know that get hurt? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. And suddenly you're not fine anymore. I think it's also part of the, of the writing ethos or the writing culture you hurt yourself, you get back on your horse, right? That's what you do. You don't just stop and think, ooh, that was not great. No, you just keep on going, right? And how many times did you finish the lesson with a, a trainer that scared you just a little bit, right? So I think there's a lot of that in the culture. Um, and so that really brings you to the point where at the end, you're just hurting because you've ignored so many signs along the way, exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, uh, another analogy that I use is that pain is just a check engine light. It doesn't mean your car needs to be sold. It means you need to go to the garage and figuring out what needs to be fixed. That's it, right? It's just your buddy saying, um, we need a modification here, right? So that's how you deal with injuries. And, and I know you and I just live that. We, we live the Fell and Christ method all the time. It becomes something that you are. It's almost like turning back the automatic update on your computer. You don't have to think about updating the software. It gets updated all the time. Yeah. Which I should do on my computer, but I never do. <laughs> because it bugs me. All right. So another big reason, another big cause of aging, of feeling old, is what scars do to you. Mm. So scars, and of course, because we have so many injuries, and then now with all the all the um, joint replacement surgeries that people do, uh, scar it's very common to have scars. And another common cause of scar, of course, is cesarean section. Right, um, a lot of people have deliveries with a C section. Um, another big type of scar is you know the breast cancer surgery, the radiation. Uh, creates internal scars. So even if you didn't have the surgery, but you've got some radiation, there's a good chance that your fascia is thickened, which brings me to the, to the idea of fascia. So in your body, you have um, bones, you have muscles, you have fatty tissue, you have the skin, you have blood vessels, you had nerves, and then there's no empty space in between, right? All that space is filled with fascia. Fascia is another soft tissue. And if you um, allow me to share my screen, uh, yep. Wendy, yeah, I'm going to show you a place where you can go um, look at really cool things, um, cool things on fascia. Let me see. Can I share my screen here? Yes. So there is a French surgeon that's called Jean-Claude Gamberto, who, who did a bunch of really, really interesting videos inside the body um, of fascia. So if you go to YouTube and you do fascia or and you see now how it's spelled, Gamberto, um, I'll just get this, it's just one minute, but I just want you to see what fascia looks like. It's all over the body and the red things that you see here are blood vessels. So your blood vessels go through fascia and you, as you see, Depending on how fascia moves, it can compress those blood vessels or not compress them. Another thing, of course, that goes through fascia is nerves. There you see fascia attached to a muscle. If you ever cooked a whole chicken, when you lift the skin of the chicken, it's kind of attached by a spider web kind of thing to the bottom, that's fascia. 
So you have the very, very thin fascia. And then you also have very thick fascia, like you have the band of fascia on the outside of your thigh that everybody's trying to stretch all the time. That's very thick fascia. And that one gives you uh, some stability and it gives you your shape. As you can see, you have very thick fascia and very light fascia. There's all types. And fascia, I'm going to stop. We're done. Um, stop. There we go. And I'm going to stop the sharing. So scar tissue is actually made of fascia. So I would like you to do a little experiment. Just take your forearm and with your fingers, just move the skin in your forearm and feel how much movement you have. Move it in a circle and imagine what's happening there. You're gliding the top layer and it's gliding on the layer under it that's gliding on the layer under it, right? And then now you do the same thing, keep your hands there and just move your wrist up and down a little bit and you feel your muscles moving and you can imagine that as, as they get harder and move they're actually gliding under your skin right so now imagine that i have a scar right here in the middle and imagine that it's fairly deep the scar you have a cut um, the body kind of heals it by sewing it together with really strong fascia so that it never happens again so now instead of your muscles being able to glide, now if you really kind of squeeze your forearm real hard and then try to move your wrist and feel what it's like to move it down, you're going to feel that at some point you're getting stuck and then if you let it go, you can go farther, right? So a scar that goes very deep has the, the potential of really interfering with movement. Now, what the scar looks like on the surface does not help you to know what it does down below. So the scars for hip joint surgeries, the scars for cesarean sections, the scar for um, neck surgery where they go from the front, those scars go through many, many layers because they go very deep. And so those deep scars can really, really get you in trouble. You know, so, Catherine, yeah. I I remember when I first started to come to see you to work on the scar from my surgery in 1984, where they, they had to go in and repair my hip socket. So I have a Mercedes incision. It's a Y shape. And I'll never forget what you said to me, because I thought it was like a Band-Aid just on the surface. And you pointed out that the scar went all the way to the hip socket. And it was shocking for me to think about that. I mean, I just couldn't understand why I was so restricted in my movement. And I just had this Band-Aid scar. And um, you know, your work has restored so much of my movement for my hip. So I can, I can so relate to that. I mean, I lived it. Yes, yeah. and it's just, and I've had the same result, the exact same result with everybody I've put my hands on in the last 30 years. I mean, it's just scars are really a problem. And the C-section scars in particular, I, I personally have two kids, both by C-section, so I practice what I preach for that one. Um, it, these are scars that people don't even think about. C-section does not register as a surgery. You just had a kid, right? And so I don't know how many, usually I see the mothers about when their kids are 15 or 20 years old. You know, they lived with it for 15 or 20 years. They've had those alterated movement patterns that their brain changed so that it wouldn't pull on the scar. Because what happens with the scar, it, it goes back to what you were saying before, is that your brain does not like the feeling of pulling a scar. And so it will limit the movement around it so that you don't get that feeling. So the C-section scar is right in the middle of your body. So of course, it's going to have an effect on the rest, right? But the way I really learned it, I had just learned to do that gentle myofascial release um, technique because it's a very gentle technique. So what I find is that the scar breakdown techniques where they go and they really, you know, use rollers and things like that, sometimes backfire because if it hurts, you do microscopic tears and microscopic tears heals, heal in microscopic scars. So by breaking up the scars, you create more scars. So sometimes- And I can helpful. attest to that because Catherine lived far away from me. And so instead of always going to see Catherine, I went to see a local person who was very aggressive and I would wind up in pain and with less movement than when I would go to Catherine 
who would do these little tiny things that seemed like nothing was happening and I would gain movement. So it's, I guess my point here is it's really important that you find someone, if you're gonna have myofascial work, who really knows what they're doing and whom you feel safe with, that you feel it's improving. And if you feel like it's not getting better, go find someone else. Um, yeah, and another reason, I'm, I totally agree with you, obviously, but the another reason why it's important that you feel safe with that person is that it's not uncommon when you undo a scar that whatever emotional state you were in where the scar was created is kind of freed. So you have people having huge emotional reactions sometimes to scar release. So you want to make sure you're with somebody that you feel confident, you know, and you feel safe with, definitely. And, and, and someone time, just saying, you know, like physical therapy done correctly also helps movement, right? I mean, exactly. It's so important in terms of the practitioner that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Totally. And the first time I really noticed the importance of scars was way back when, when I was starting, there was an, a lady who would come with a hip replacement um, surgery. And I started, I had just learned the technique. So I practiced it on her scar saying, let's see how it works. And uh, when, when she came back the next time, he, she said, you know what? Before you'd worked on the scar, I had a pain in my foot that nobody knew what it was. It was there all the time. The doctors had no idea what it was. They said it couldn't come from the surgery. And the pain was gone after my, I didn't even know she had pain in the foot, right? So, but it makes sense. I mean, the nerve that goes to the foot goes through the hip. So of course it could have gotten caught in that scar. And when a scar is tight, the amount of pressure it can apply can be up to two tons per square centimeter, not per square inch, per square centimeter. So imagine if a nerve or a blood vessel is pinched with that much strength, you know how much pain it can create. So sometimes a, a scar can limit movement and sometimes it can create pain way far from where the scar was created. So, um, so it's very important. If you had any kind of injury or surgery right now, just go see somebody who can do gentle myofascial release. And, and you know, heart, um, I remember you telling me about a man who had open heart surgery and he had so much pain. And after you did the work on the scar, it, it, so it's, you know, sometimes we don't even think about what a, where a scar is or what a scar is or that it can have an effect. Um, yeah, and it's very common. I mean, uh, when people come to see me the first time, I ask a million questions, right? And I always ask about scars, but I never get the answer until the third or fourth session because people we forget. Right. I mean, especially writers, man, if I had to remember every time I hurt myself, I couldn't, I really couldn't, right? So um, just just think through it, just keep it in the back of your mind. And if you think, oh, that's right. And sometimes I see scars on people and I said, so tell me the story about that one. And they go and they look, that scar, I don't, oh, I do have a scar there, you know? So you never quite know. Um, it's not something that we pay attention to, but it is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. Yeah. And again, so radiation makes a difference too. So if, then you really will not have any surface scar. But then if you use, so this thing that I, that I showed you is a good way to figure out whether the scar is a problem or not, okay? Because you can think of it as uh, north, south, east, and west. For example, you can think, okay, I can move the skin north and south, east and west, right? You should be able to do it in all those directions pretty evenly. But if you feel like there's a restriction, then you know you need to work on a myofascial release. Good, so we solved injuries, we solved habits of movement, we've solved scars. The next one is the fun one. It's the hormonal changes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wendy and I had plenty of discussions on that one. <laughs> so um, there's, two, there's three really moments where you have very abrupt hormonal changes when you're a teenager if you get pregnancy right while you're pregnant and afterwards and then menopause and they're all a fun ride and everybody does it differently but what's very interesting is that it, it kind of changes your hormonal landscapes which means i don't have to tell you changes in the skin in the soft tissue in the muscles and let's not even mention the hot flashes yeah right but <laughs> one of the thing it does when you go through menopause and you decrease uh, the amount of hormones you have your muscle strength starts to change 
right? You don't have the same strength you had before. It's very common. So one of the things you need to keep in mind is as you age, you might have to start developing a regular strengthening program just to keep your muscles at the same um, in the, at the same strength they were before. When you're young, if you don't do anything, you keep your strength. If you strengthen them, you gain strength. But after menopause, you have to get a strengthening program just to keep your strength going. So that's one thing I would recommend. Another thing I would recommend is to start stretching your muscles a little bit gently. Muscles, as they get older, lose water and transform into fat. Hmm, aren't you happy about that? So in general, when you're older, you have less water in your body and more fat. That's the way it goes, right? So that muscle that's been transformed into fat needs to get strengthened a little bit just so that you keep the same amount of muscle you had before. Which brings me to one thing that's not really, I mean, it's an important thing in aging. I would like you to think about the medicines you're taking as you age because some medicines are soluble in water, some are soluble in fat. So if you're taking a medicine that's soluble in water, as you get older, it's gonna become more potent because it's gonna be less dissolved in water. On the other hand, if you have a medicine that's soluble in fat, as you get older, the same amount of medicine will be less potent because it's more dissolved. So if all of a sudden the medicines that work well for you all of a sudden don't, just kind of do a little bit of research and think about what's happened because your body composition has changed. So just be aware of that. You can stay ahead of it by just the strengthening. So Catherine, uh, this uh, makes me wonder, is it more important for us to drink water as we age? Yes, and I think, I think that's always the right solution, right? I think it's always good to drink water. But yes, because you retain less water. Definitely. Yeah, because um, Joyce Harmon, which you, you and I both know, mm -hmm. she mentioned something about drinking a glass of water before she went to bed at night uh, as something that she was doing. And I thought about that. And so now I've made a practice of drinking at least eight ounces when I get up and drinking at least eight ounces before I go to sleep. And the funny thing is I don't have to get up in the middle of the night to pee. <laughs> and that it's perfect because you bring me to the next thing, which is gravity and the effect of gravity on water and on our back. I saw somebody was talking about uh, back issues, right? So I've got my little spine here. Let me see if the camera can focus. There we go. That's there it. We go. Okay. So you have the body of the vertebra there, and then you have those discs that you've heard so much about here, right? And so the disc is a bit like a sponge. Um, it's really filled with water. It's got a lot of water in it. And as you stand and as gravity weighs on you all day long, your discs are squeezed a little bit and they lose water. So you're actually shorter at the end of the day than you are at the beginning of the day. Because it's like a sponge that you squeeze and the water comes out. What happens is then when you go to bed at night and you lie down, your discs have a chance to become bigger again. It, the water goes back into them. And by the time you wake up in the morning, you're tall again. So drinking just before you go to bed makes a lot of sense to me because yeah. how can you refill your discs if you don't have any water to refill them with, right? Yeah. Which also brings the importance of spending enough time lying down, enough time sleeping that you stay ahead of gravity, right? Which makes me think that one of the best way to strengthen your muscles when you get older is to do it with as little gravity as possible. So I'm thinking about swimming, for example, where you can strengthen your muscles and you're not squeezed with gravity. Or uh, Pilates exercises where you're on the machine lying down and you're getting stronger. So just kind of start thinking about that. Gravity is the thing that's there all the time that we have to deal with all the time. So gravity is compressing you and start to add activities that decompress you. That's why I talked about the stretching, the Pilates, you can do all kinds of yoga, you know, all these things that help you get longer again uh, are gonna become more, import more and more important as you go. I find that now I have to regularly stretch in the evening. I mean, if I do a lot of stalls or if I lift a lot of heavy things, I just take five minutes in the evening to stretch 
just a little bit my back in whatever way I feel, and it makes a big difference. And and Catherine, you know, I, I know that discs are made out of vitamin C and amino acids and water. I mean, that's their composition. So is it important for us to supplement or at least make sure we get enough protein and vitamin C so that those discs can stay nice and fluffy? So that is really not my field of expertise, but that was going to be my recommendation is to find somebody who can help you navigate first the ups and downs of the hormones. There are doctors who can help you with that. And again, everybody's different, right? And also you will find as you go through all the, these fun ups and downs that you need different things at different times. But so don't assume again that the hormonal thing is something you can't do anything about. Um, there are things that you might, it might take a lot of trial and then it might work for a while and not for a while, but it's really worth keeping on top of it. So we have a couple of questions. I think it's in, that we should okay. ask them here. Um, one is, uh, and you touched on this strengthening programs um, for um, aging women, any suggestions on that? And, and I have heard that, that there's a need to work out with a certain amount of weights to keep our muscles really healthy. So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yes, I can. And at the same time, it's, it's something where I don't want to give a recipe that's going to work for everybody, as you know, right? Yeah. I'm always worried about weights because people tend to overdo it, right? But yes, you need, I, so I think that if you do, it depends on the kind of riding you do. But if you ride and if you do, let's say 15 minutes of a posting trot or 10 minutes of a posting trot, that's a pretty nice workout already. So count the riding into your workout if you mm. do something where you're riding. If you work your horse in hand, yes, you also have a good lengthening program there, right? So there's a lot of things around the horse that make sense. And it's also how you think about it. There was that study that I love where uh, they had people who were um, cleaning rooms in a hotel. And they told half of the folks who were cleaning rooms that it was a good workout for them. And they didn't tell the other half. The half that thought that was a workout actually gained muscle mass and the other ones didn't. So the way you think about what you do also makes a big difference. So if we think that mucking our stalls is building muscle mass, we're in good shape. <laughs> you know, you should have heard me yesterday. I'm like, yep, that's good for my quads. And I can feel my shoulders going and I know it's heavy, but I know I'm going to be stronger tomorrow. Right. So, I mean, the way you think of it makes a big difference. Uh, if, you, if it's a day where like there's snow and you have to mug those stalls again and it's hard, you're probably going to hurt more than if you think, OK, well, this is my workout for the day. Let's do it. You know, that's it makes a big difference. And so really anything that's anti -gra I think swimming is awesome. Um, riding a bicycle might be a good thing too, because you're not fully on your legs and on your, on your knees. And, and le let's make sure we address the knees and the hips in a minute too. Uh, because right. we just, um, right. So we have um, a question about bone density loss. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that you're gonna touch on soon or sh should I leave that question or should we tackle it? Well, we can talk about it. Um, again, this is not my area of expertise, right? It's very important that you work with a nutritionist and with a doctor to know exactly what you need to do. And the, what I find with that, the reason why I'm not gonna address it too much is that it seems to be changing all the time, right? I'm sure you've, you've experienced the same thing. What I learned 10 years ago is not the same thing as what I'm learning now. And who knows what we're gonna learn in 10 years, right? So I think people are different. And they, um, if you have, a loss of bone density, you really have to be careful, right? Just think about something though. Um, bones react to the pressure that's put on them. So in your bones, there's continuous renewal, renewal, right? So you have those osteoclasts that come and they're like little excavators. They excavate the old bone and then you have the osteoblasts that come and they build new bone behind it, right? And as you get older, the destroyers go faster than the builders, right? That's the problem. That's when you get into osteopenia and then osteoporosis. The bone in theory reacts to the amount of force that's applied to it. That's why when astronauts go in space, they lose bone mass because the bone does not feel that pressure. And so it does not build something that's meant to withstand that pressure, right? So. Once you get to osteoporosis or even osteopenia, 
putting more weight on your bone might not be a good idea because they're more fragile. But when you exercise your muscles, when the muscles get strong, get bigger as you, as you flex them, they actually put pressure on your bone and that helps recreate bone. So I, I'm not gonna give you a one solution for it, but I want you to think about all those things. You have to, that's why I say it has to be tailored to everybody. You have to find the exercise that will give you just the amount of impetus for that osteoblast to work harder without putting pressure on your bone or, or putting your- so, um, You know, it kind of makes me think about, we've talked about horses and taking uh, radiographs to kind of know a baseline that knowing your bone density gives you a baseline so that you know if you do a certain amount of exercise or certain types of exercise you're not damaging but at the same time you know bone does need that little bit of concussion and this right. is where uh, ruthie alon's bones for life um is a very interesting program and it's um right have you done it i, I did it years ago she's um but it's it's designed to just keep telling the bones to stay healthy. Yeah, and that's actually a great idea. And that's why walking is such a good exercise because you get the gravity on your bones without the concussion that you don't want. You want pressure, but you don't want um, Pounding. concussion, right? You don't want a shock. So you want to gently, uh, yes, yeah, so Bones for Life definitely, which is, um, it's also based on the Feldenkrais method, but really focused on the bone health. And I think also that the nutrition, again, you have to talk to a doctor or a nutritionist about what would be the best for you. Definitely. Good. I'm just putting that in here. Um, the Bones for Life, yeah. Good. Fast. Yeah, but there's a, um, her program is still alive. Yes. Um, and she actually worked with NASA at one point because of this issue with gravity and, and bones and everything. So, um, so that's a good resource. All right. And so I'm just going to take up the talk about the last part um, of, of aging that we think about, um, which is repetitive stress injury. So one of the things I do also in my spare time is I do ergonomics, right? And so what ergonomics does is you try to set up people's environment and work environment in such a way that they don't overuse one part over and over again. You know, the typical, where do you put your monitor, where do you put your chair, that kind of stuff the most common repetitive stress injury movement we have is the mouse, right? Yes. I mean, how many times a day do we do that? If I told you, okay, I have a new exercise for you. You're going to do this 2000 times a day. <laughs> would you think it would be a good idea? No. Really, right? But, but when you do the mouse, you don't even realize you're doing it, right? And so if I work on the mouse, this joint is going to be very unhappy very quickly because I'm going to use it 2,000 more times a day than I use the other joints in my hand, right? So th the idea is to see in your environment what you're doing repetitively and to see if there's a way to vary it. One of the other example, when we shovel, we always do it in the same way. Now, I'm not saying that changing is a good idea because sometimes there's a good reason why you do it that way, but breaking, breaking it down, instead of doing five stalls at a time, do one stall, then go do something else and do another stall. Just think about how many times you ask the same joint to do the same thing. And you get into that area when we talk about injuries. Remember, let's say you have 15 injuries and the only joint that's still working in your left knee. Well, then no matter what you do, you're gonna hurt your left knee. So again, the solution there is setting up your environment so that you have options, so that it's not always the same. The example for the computer is to make sure that, for example, your mouse, you can easily move to the left hand. It's not a problem. So you can- And that's great for your riding. And it's great for your riding, definitely. To be dexterous and more dexterous with your left hand. I know a lot of people just went, uh, but it's a really good way to improve your manual dexterity for riding using your left brain. Yes. And, and that uh, feeling is just your brain saying, oh, that's not a habit. We need to create a new program. So it's actually a good thing. When you get into that, oh, this is hard. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even remember where my left is anymore. That's good. It's the updating part of the brain that we're talking about. So if you, if you put that into the writing, then I'm going to 
Wendy is going to chime in here a little bit, and I didn't I forgot to tell you about that, but you'll do it. Okay. Uh, think about the saddle you use. Does it still fit you? Think about the height of your stirrups. Change them. Talk to Wendy about adding a shim to your stirrup. Yes. And that's where, yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about the shim? Yeah, um, especially on Western saddles and in some cases on English saddles. Um, and I have a video about this um, on the Murdoch Method YouTube channel. But when you twist the, the flat plane, when you have a Western fender and it has a stirrup leather that's two to three inches wide, geometry dictates that when you twist that into position, one side's lower than the other. It's just physics. But then you go to put your foot on this angled surface, okay? And what you do is you either cock your ankle or you roll your foot and neither of those are gonna help your knee. So, you know, I created shims, they're cheap, they're on the website, you know, um, you just that wrap them onto your stirrups and it levels your footbed and now your foot has a flat surface. And I have to tell you that that one thing has alleviated more knee pain than anything else I have ever done for riders. Just leveling the stirrups so your foot has a flat surface to be on. Um, with English saddles, sometimes if you have, say, a very round horse and a short stirrup, the stirrups are going to be wind up angled and then you shim. And sometimes you shim because of your conformation. And that you can find more about in my 50 fixes, uh, 50 fixes to improve your riding book. I have a whole chapter about why you would shim English. Um, but for Western, almost not 100%, but most Western saddles need shims because this fender leather is so wide that when you twist it, it's angled. Yes, definitely. And it's it's helped people uh, with me who had ankle issues too, because people get ankle issues. How many people twist their ankle working on an even terrain, right? And so it may be that you end up with an ankle that just doesn't like one particular angle. Right. And so you want to support it, right? right? Another place where you want to think of where we spend a lot of time, we used to spend a lot of time, is cars. We don't do as much anymore. <laughs> So think of this car or your car the same way. You can change the height of your seat. You can change how close the stirrup is. And again, it's due to your structure. I have long thighs, short calves, and short, short arms. So I need to move my seat back, but I need to bring my steering wheel forward. You know, so just really think of that. These are all things of little details that you repeat every day that are going to make you feel stiff and sore and make you think that you're aging when in fact you're just overusing one body part. That's all that it is. So I would like to touch on to something. Okay, so there's some solutions and I'll, um, I'll share a, a slide at the end so that you have all the parts and all the solutions so that you can see it. But now I would like you to put yourself in your horse's um, place for a moment. What does it feel for a horse to have an old rider as an owner? So what I find, what, the reason why I love to work with riders is that if they come and tell me they're hurting somewhere, I usually ask them what problem their horse has. Which lead does he have a hard time to take at the canter? How is he on the circle? What is easy for them? What is hard for them? And I can usually find that same problem in the person, depending on where their weight is. So, a lot of us are uneven in the way we sit, and I include myself in that, right? So imagine what it's like, what it would be like to have a backpack that's loading on one side all day long. You know that that shoulder would start to be a little bit sore and old too, right? So even if you do, don't do all that for yourself, I say do it for, because I know that horse people will have like 15, a whole team to take care of their horses, but <laughs> never go to see the doctor, right? And I'm including myself in that. And I'm just part of the group. But really think of your horse. And if you don't do it for yourself, do it for your horse. Learn how you move so that you can move better and so that it's easier for your horse to do what they need to do. Um, and when I talk to my vet friends, so I'm a physical therapist for people and for horses. So what I really like to do is work on both on the horse and on the rider. And when I talk to my vet friends, they always think that I am so lucky because the worst problem for the horse is the rider, of course, and they have no way of fixing the rider when they try to fix the horse, right? So they always say, oh, we would love so much to be able to fix the rider because it's the main, the main disease of the horse, right? 
So everything we talked about now, think about it for your older horse too. Everything we talked about can be applied to your horses. Think about the scars your gelding has, right? Think about the habits of movement. How did they learn to move? Now, they learn how to move some with their mom in the pasture, but then they are taught how to move by humans after that, right? So they have that part. We have that part too. If you get into learning a sport, the trainer or the coach is usually going to modify your movement, right? And tell you how to modify it. So we go through some kind of movement learning as well. But just think about what your horse had to learn and whether it fits what you're asking him or her to do now. Uh, for repetitive stress injury, think about saddles, right? If the saddle doesn't fit the horse, it's going to provide some repetitive. Again, it's nothing horrible. It's not like every time you, you sit on that saddle, it creates a lot of pain for that horse, but it's the cumulative effect of it. And then, of course, think about the way to fix it, which is the surefoot pads, because it does the same thing. It allows your horse to feel what they're doing so that they can start to explore. And you see that with the pads, right? They explore all kinds of stuff. It's always fun to see. And then when they step off, they have a different movement pattern. You can see their brain has been rewired. So there we go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share that last. Um... And, then, and then Catherine, I'd like to go back and kind of a touch on some of these uh, things that people have put up in the chat. Okay. Oh, I'm not able to share that one. Okay. Let me see. So somebody's asking you about what I think of the stirrup treads that are deliberately angled. Um, a lot of times it's too much. Um, the shims that I use, they're, I think, about a quarter of an inch. And when you get those angled stirrup pads, they're way too much. And then they rock your ankle out to the other side. So, um, oh, and Hansha shared the video of doing the Western stirrups. Um, and I saw a question about Beamer, right, about the scar. So let me just talk to that really quickly. I do use Beamer in my office with everybody and on the horses. I use both. Um, and that's the one thing I can objectively talk about in Beamer. The rest, it it's depends on the people. But the reason why I use it in my office is that when I work on scars, the scars soften faster. I've You'll have to re sort of reorganize the scar, though, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Beamer doesn't do it by itself, right? right? But when I do the myofascial release, I do feel a difference in how quickly it does. For those who do not know, Beamer is a um, something that improves, uh, that optimizes your blood flow. So it's just, it's very logical. It's anything that optimizes the blood flow in the body is going to improve the, um, the nutrients coming into the muscles and the waste product coming out of the muscle. You know, it, it's just, a, it, it's nothing fancy. It's just a logical thing. It's a mat you lie on. It's got um, electromagnetic uh, energy and that helps to, um, the, the, the pattern in the beamer really targets the little muscles that are in your veins. So it helps your vein stay a little bit longer, um, younger, longer. That's the, that's the idea. So it's a maintenance thing. It's not a, it's not a treatment tool. It's just a maintenance tool. So yes, it can have an effect on the scar. Um, what do you think about inversion tables? Um, I don't like them. Okay. For one reason is that most of the time, as you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have tight hip flexors, right? And so I'm going to, well, actually he's going to help me. So a lot of people have tight hip flexors, which means that these hip flexors, they attach on the lower part. Let me see. There we go. They attach on your low back and then they go around here and they attach on your leg. So what they do when they're tight, they keep your low back a little bit arched like this. That's one of the things they do, right? So you cannot lie fully flat with your back on the table. There's a little bit of space. So now if I, if I invert yourself, with the 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 fascia the so as the hip flexor is still tight it won't help your back very much will it as long as these muscles don't relax you won't get the stretching you want so the idea is great but in practical terms um it doesn't work for a lot of people 
that's my thinking. And that's where the, the, um, the Feldenkrais work is so valuable because you, in a way you learn to rewire that habitual muscle contraction to let that go so that you're not living with it. Um, because if you're trying to overcome a habit, your muscles are not contracting without them being told to contract. The nervous system runs the muscles, the brain runs the muscles. So if a muscle is tight and contracted, it's because your brain is telling it to do that. And then trying to artificially cause it to stretch or let go doesn't really get to it because then the brain just tightens it again. So with the Feldenkrais method, yeah. we're really working with the brain and learning to tell the brain it doesn't have to do that anymore to optimize movement. And then you're not in this constant battle of tight, trying to pull it apart tight. You, you just, you don't do it anymore. I mean, that's and, and, to, and to add to what you're saying is you don't really need to stretch it out. All you need is to stop compressing it. Right. Right. So if you just let the muscle lengthen, then your back will, at the end of a Feldenkrais lesson, it's, it's very, you, uh, most people feel, feel a little bit taller at the end, right? Your back comes closer to the floor and you feel a little bit taller just because you stop compressing. Yeah. So there, there's a question here. Um, my, it says, my mother wrote until just before she turned 90. The thing that stopped her from continuing was that she struggled to dismount. Do you have any suggestions on how to make dismounting easier for an older person? Um, again, uh, the, the only way something is successful is if it's tailored to, to that particular person. I do not know why she was not able to dismount, right? I haven't seen this person. I don't have a good idea, right? They can be different things. You need to address the cause, right? So if she's 90, again, I have not seen your mother, but there, there's a good chance that her rib cage is not as flexible as it was 10 years ago right? That's one thing. There's also a possibility that the hip has a hard time clearing the horse, right? So um, two things I use for the folks who have problems. I'm just going to give you ideas. I don't know what's going to work with your mother. Um, I'm assuming she's not dismounting to the ground. Is she? Can you tell me how she's dismounting? Um, she's that, uh, that question came from, hang on, because I've Dorothy Marks. So Dorothy, if you can just uh, you take a little more information into the chat, that would be helpful. Because what I would do is to have something that you can dismount to, right? Yeah. And one of the options would be if you shorten the left stirrup before you dismount, it's going to be easier for her to clear the back of the saddle, right? Also, I don't know how much she leans forward, but if you can really lean forward on the horse, it's going to be less hard also to lift the leg. Another option we use with some of the people we work with who are severely impaired is to dismount from the front. So to have the right leg come over the horse's neck to the left. But there's a big but for that one. You need to have a horse who doesn't lift their head when you do that, okay? Right. So the horse has to be strained for that one. But some horses are perfectly fine with that. That's another option. Also, a saddle that's a little flatter in the back so that she doesn't have to lift it as high, right? Make sure she never has a spur on her leg, right? When she dismounts, if she, if she scrapes a little bit. And then anything that makes the foot slide a little bit better. Again, I'm assuming these are her problems, but I don't know. Um, Dorothy says she found it painful sliding down, but this is where, you know, I think if we go to the therapeutic riding model and look at some of the ways that they train their people and their horses for people to dismount that have disabilities, you can find an adaption for your mom. And, you know, if it, if her problem is sliding down, have the horse learn how to stand quietly by a nice tall mounting block. So there's no sliding. Definitely. Um, I would definitely do that. It also depends on the height of the horse, right? If right. it's an 18 hand horse or if it's a 13 hand pony, we'll have a different solution to it. But, but yes, I would not do the sliding down. I would, I would not do that. I would dismount to something a little bit higher than the ground. Um, and yeah, and that's, you know, we, we sometimes don't want to think of ourselves as disabled, but that we just are. that we they've are. worked through a lot of things to make it easier. And if we go to that model and look, well, how are they doing that with people that, you know, struggle or have physical issues, we can learn ways to make it easier for ourselves. And, and it's important with a horse, easier means safer, right? 
Yeah. Because if, if you make it hard to dismount, the horse is going to feel your stress. You're going to hit him on the way up or down. And then you risk all kinds of stuff. So with horses, easier always means safer, which yeah. is very important when you get to be 90 years old. And, and yes, I understand that 90 year olds can be difficult to bring in new ideas. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Humor works for that. Yeah. I work with and, and the thing is, you know, if she really wants to keep riding, then she'll be willing to, to learn. And what you have to do is break it down into little pieces and have her practice doing parts of it before she has to do all of it getting off the horse. Um, and then ask, ask somebody like me. I mean, just give me a video, ask me some, there's people out there we're trading hypotherapy or therapeutic riding, and our job is to figure out how to make it possible, how right. to make the impossible possible. So there's plenty of resources there. And um, um, so yeah, yes, mental flexibility is a big part of it. But I think that that's one of the things we're talking about here is that if you, it, as as we age, it's so important that we keep mentally flexible to look for options so that we can keep riding, whether that means getting a taller mounting block, whether that means adapting our equipment, whether that means having somebody help us. But we have, you know, if I always think about aging as the loss of movement, mental, emotional, and physical. And you know, the here we are talking about the mental aspect, which I watched with my mom, mm -hmm. um, that she became so limited. So the more we can practice that now, before we get to our mom's age where they're not flexible, we will be more flexible. We and will. Again, you know, we train. We train to work hard, and there's one right way to do things. And you know, that's the way we, in, in the horse world. It's a tough learning, right? It's not a. It's not all butterflies and, and, and unicorns, right? And so it's not cheating, it's being smart and it's harder on your horse, it's easier on your horse. If you mount from a block, your horse is gonna be a lot more comfortable than if you mount from the ground. Now it's helpful if you're on a trail that to be able to mount back from the floor because they, from the ground because things happen, but you, know, you can also find a place a little bit higher that you can get to or whatever, yeah. Yep. It's not cheating. It's smart. And what right. happens when you age is that you don't have a choice anymore. So you have to become smart. You cannot not be smart anymore. That's the difference. When you're young, you can be very stupid and you don't. <laughs> have for it. But when you get to a certain age, you have to become smart. That's all. Right. And, and the more we practice that in little ways, then, and, and again, I go back to the Feldenkrais method. I think the one thing that's done for me the most is learning how to learn and how to break it down. And if I can't do it one way, then come up with three other ways that I can do something so I can still do what I want. It's, it's about creativity and flexibility in our thoughts so that we can be creative and flexible in our bodies Definitely. to do the things we really wanna do. It's all in your head. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in your brain, right? That's the way it is. So if you're interested in doing classes, I teach classes now with the pandemic, everybody's teaching, teaching classes online. Uh, Wendy's doing a course online. I don't teach writing, that's not what I do. I just um, teach movement that writers can then use to do whatever they want to do. Wendy, on the other hand, as you know, teaches writing. We both have online courses. Um, I don't, do, you don't have a regular online class, right? Um, class. No, but um, mine is all on horse class, I'll put that. Uh, it used to be CRK training and now it's horse class. I have three online courses, the effortless rider, the effortless rider over fences, and then the ABC on the aids. And my courses have a lot of unmounted stuff that you can do, a lot of Feldenkrais based uh, movements and things to improve your riding. Um, and, uh, you know, on my, on my website, I have different kinds of training aids to help like Franklin balls are really useful when you're in the saddle and your hip is a little bit tight to sit on some Franklin balls to open the hip. So there's, there are a lot of things available to older women to keep riding. And it's a question of um, being open and looking for those options. Um, and hopefully this webinar has given you a lot of ideas, a lot of options. Um, well, the one thing I think that you didn't really cover a whole lot um, is uh, something for their hips, like oh, right. price, okay. but something okay. specifically okay. about hips. I just went ahead and put my website in the chat so that you oh, know kineticbalance.com and it's here too. Are, are you sure you put it in the chat because it didn't come up? Did you put it for uh, I'm just now pushing enter. There, there we go. go. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. So 
um, talking about the hips and the knees because they kind of really are obviously two sides of the same bone, right? <laughs> so they're actually very linked. Um, remember when I talked about the amount of sitting we do and how we learn to ignore ourselves, right? So when you're sitting, the way your weight is connected to your seat is through your sits bone and the hips really don't do much, right? So we spend a lot of time not using our hips. And you've seen people getting up and just kind of still looking, you could still see the shape of their seat as they're walking around, right? We spend so much time in sitting that we have lost a lot of the awareness around our hips. Plus their hips are close to the neither region, so we don't spend a lot of time there anyway, right? That's not something where we do. So we tend to have very low awareness of the hips. There's one more thing. We use the word hip, the word hip for three different body parts. You put your hands on your hips there. When you go to the tailor, these are your hips. And in fact, your hip joints are right there. So it's, it, the confusion is huge about that. So your hips are, they are a ball joint, right? So they can do all kinds of movements. Really, really nice. At the bottom of your hips, at the bottom of the thigh bone, the femur, you've got the knee. And the knee is just a bend, basically a bend and extend joint. It has a tiny bit of rotation here at the bottom, just 15 degrees, but really not much. It's really a bend and extend. So when you stop using your hips, what's happening is that a lot of the turning is going to have to happen somewhere. And so your knee is being asked to do things that is really not designed to do. And so what I found in my work is that if somebody comes for a, with a knee issue, unless there was an injury, right? If you were hit by a horse or a car accident, that's a different story, right? But if your knee is starting to hurt, then what I know is I have to look at that hip because it's probably not functioning properly, which goes back to the same idea. Whichever's hurt is the one that works the best. You don't need to fix that one. You need to fix the other ones. So a lot of hip issues, I think, are due to lack of awareness. And a lot of the, um, the things we do, I'm sure you do the same thing too, Wendy, is um, making people aware of her, where their hip joints are. Yeah, it's and one of my first lessons. Yeah, the same thing for me too, because really the hip is such in the, it's in the middle of the body. So if, if the hips are not working, the hips are where you stand on. If you don't know where your hips are, what do you expect? right? So hip awareness is really a big, big deal. And I'm sure you can find online uh, Feldenkrais classes that are free. Um, there's one particular class that's called the pelvic clock. That's really a basic thing that's really helpful for everybody, right? Um, yeah. I would definitely look it up if I were you. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Catherine. This has been, uh, people have really enjoyed it. There's been a lot of really nice comments here. And um, really found this very, very helpful and inspiring. So uh, I think it was a, a great topic, a right time. Here we are with nasty weather outside. We got a lot of people inside and we all wanna get ready for riding this spring, so. Yes, and I want you to be comfortable and ride forever as long as you want to. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining us and just remember to go out and enter the contest. The drawing's gonna be tomorrow on my Friday webinar. Um, and it's for a pair of Surefoot pads. And then we have some great guests lined up for next week. So we'll see you back here again soon. Thank Wonderful. you so much for tuning in. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Bye. Bye.